All right, looks like we have critical mass and can get started. Uh, thanks everyone for joining today. Uh, we're here today for uh, another event in our uh, sales and business development support programming series on conducting effective sales conversations. So welcome, uh, my name is Ian Adams. I'm managing director here at Evergreen Climate Innovations. And I work on our platform activities, essentially all of the work that provides support and services for the companies in our portfolio and beyond. Uh, other companies in the Midwest as well. Uh, if you're not familiar with us, we're a nonprofit that supports uh, early stage entrepreneurs in the climate tech space. We make investments and support those companies to help them uh, reach critical milestones and go raise additional funding. So we really act uh, across uh, venture development support to help out those companies uh, here in the Midwest United States. All of the investments we make are in companies between uh, Pittsburgh and Denver. And then we're also uh, a supporter of the ecosystem in general. So hosting networking events, uh, providing other activities and resources that we can uh, provide to support entrepreneurs in the climate tech space. Um, part of that is this series. We are currently working on this series uh, to provide tools and training related to business development and sales for early stage entrepreneurs. And so, uh, you may have joined us last week. We had a session on how to create a sales pipeline with our sales consultant, Scott McClintock. Uh, today, we're gonna be talking about how to uh, conduct effective sales conversations. And this is uh, a series of events. We'll have other events in the future. Our next event, which we're still planning, be in a, a couple months on channel strategies and, and how to approach uh, channel strategies and partnerships. But uh, excited to be here today with uh, Eric Burkertz, who happens to be my boss as well. Uh, but in addition to that, he's got a ton of experience uh, in the energy space, running organizations, uh, pitching business, uh, uh, running organizations in the energy space. So I'm going to turn it over to him to introduce himself and get things started. Eric? Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining us. So I am uh, Eric Burkertz. I'm the CEO of Evergreen Climate Innovations. Uh, and I've been with the organization since 2013. Uh, but prior to joining Evergreen, I spent nearly 20 years in the private sector uh, and had the, the, the good fortune to be on the executive team of two venture funded companies that we were able to scale very quickly and bring public via IPOs. And, uh, you know, across my career, I have had to sell directly. Um, I've had to manage sales teams, and I've had to manage channel partnerships. And I've also, uh, as I'm sure many of you have, I've been on the other side of the table, the buying side, uh, more, so, more times than I can count. And, and these experiences have also been very informative about you know, what is and what is not uh, an effective sales conversation. Um, so as we go through today, the, the, the one point I do want to emphasize is that no matter what your profession or your role, selling is and will be a critical competency for long-term professional success. So I hope some of what I covered today will be helpful to all of you, irrespective of what you do day to day. Um, so one of the... Uh, one of the things about sales is that there's just a, a ton of mythology around sales. Um, many people believe that being good at it is some sort of innate preternatural gift that some people have and others do not. Um, and, you know, the, the fact is that this mythology has been debunked. Um, most people can be effective at sales. That's the good news. The bad news is that being good at sales is hard work. It's a skill and it's a discipline that requires homework and embrace of processes and reps, just lots of repetitions to get good at it. Uh, so what we'll do today is we'll take some time to walk through a, a proven, proven sales methodology that we have found to be very powerful. Um, and basically it's based on using structured questions to really understand and uncover customer needs. And as a part of that questioning process, you're building perceived value of your product or service so that 
you're ultimately going to close more deals. And as we'll talk about, it's not going to be you trying to convince somebody why they should do business with you, but by virtue of having conversations and questions with them, they'll come to that conclusion themselves. So I'll speak for about 40 minutes. And then at that point, uh, we can take some questions. So if you do have questions, uh, please type them into the QA function. Uh, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll go from there. All right. So as we talked about, um, there is a way of conducting an effective sales meeting through asking structured questions. Uh, and the process I'm going to be talking about was developed by a gentleman named Neil Rackham over 30 years ago, but it remains very, very relevant today. Uh, and the process is called spin selling. Um, and basically, each letter in the word spin corresponds to a type of question to ask the prospect or the customer that you're looking to do business with. So today will be really sort of a high level Cliff Notes version or introduction to the concept of spin selling. And the book is available on Amazon. So in the event you're looking to deep, dive deeper, you can certainly buy it and read it. But today is really meant to give you the, the, the general framework. So basically, Rackham sets out four stages in a typical sales cycle. I would argue that there are actually five stages. The, the very first stage being all the homework and the analysis you do before a meeting. So for those of you who joined us last week when Scott McClintock spoke, he discussed the importance of you know, identifying value propositions as well as understanding who you are selling to and developing profiles and personas uh, of those people so that you can begin better positioning your conversation with them as you go into that sales conversation. But looking at the stages that Rackham presents, most people think that the last stage is demonstrating commitment or capability and obtaining commitment are where the magic happens. Rackham disagrees. His research uncovered that the investigation phase, you know, asking good questions in the right sequence is more correlated with success than any other part of the sales cycle. So asking questions in the right sequence is really what spin selling is all about. And there are four types of questions. There are situation questions, there are problem questions, implication questions, and need payoff questions. So situation questions are, are simply data gathering questions. You know, you wanna minimize those questions in a sales conversation with a lot of upfront homework, but they're data gathering questions and they're meant to confirm some of your assumptions. Problem questions are really the questions meant to uncover problems, challenges, dissatisfaction, pain points. Implication questions are questions that explore the sort of the effects and consequences of a client's problem. And then the need payoff question really focus the discussion on solutions. And at this point, what you're really hoping to achieve is you want the client or the customer to really in their minds be articulating the benefits of your solution, not you trying to sort of convince them why your solution is the best. You want them to come to that conclusion themselves. So we'll get into this here in, you know, in more detail, but those are the you know, kind of the four types of questions and the sequence that they kind of, the sequence to follow in a sales conversation. And the goal is by asking really good questions in the right sequence that customers are going to realize that you can help them without you having to sort of badger them or cajole them or try to, you know, try some schmarmy, you know, closing technique on them. You know, as this graph illustrates, as you ask the questions and your prospect thinks about them, they begin to realize that you can help them. And that's that that's kind of the magic behind this process. And 
again, it's them coming to this conclusion themselves is what makes it powerful. So what I'd like to do to sort of help illustrate and crystallize, you know, how this might work in a, in a sales cycle is to create a fictitious scenario. Um, so for context of today, uh, let's pretend that we're selling a, an electric vertical takeoff and landing aircraft, uh, an EV toll um, to a target market, uh, the target market being a department of transportation in, in a large city. So that's kind of the scenario, okay? So homework and advanced preparation are essential. Uh, you know, last week, Scott McClintock talked about the, the importance of defining value propositions before sales calls and really understanding kind of what your most important value propositions are. And then also, you know, thinking about customers and, and kind of the personas and who you're going to be selling to. Um, one framework that, that, you know, I've found helpful, you know, before going to say sales calls is to sort of take this, this, this framework here uh, and work through it. Um, and basically, you know, what you're trying to think through is, you know, what's important to the customer and how differentiated you are relative to your competitors, right? And, you know, when you look at this graph, you know, the bottom left is sort of, you know, interesting, but nah, you know, it's not going to move the customer to a buy decision. So in the case of a, you know, an EV toll, this could be maybe you have leather seats or massaging seats or the design of the aircraft is really cool. You know, that's, you know, it's kind of neat, but it's not going to lead to a sale. Antes are really the table stakes where, you know, if you don't, meet kind of these antes, you're not in the game. Um, and this is really, you know, things like, look, safety and redundancy. Look, the aircraft, you know, has to be safe or, you know, you're not, you're not even, you know, in the game. You know, it has to meet regulatory, you know, it has to be meet regulatory compliance. You know, it has to be vertical takeoff and landing. It has to be quiet. Uh, you have to have decent ground speed, right? These are all antis. These let you kind of be in the game, but they're not going to win the sale for you, you know, standing alone because most of your competitors probably can, you know, offer these up as well. So you really want to be thinking about what are those raises, right? What is going to set you apart and what matters to the customer? Too much time in most sales conversations is spent talking about the antis when the conversation really should be focused on the raises. And, you know, in this context, again, with EV tolls, you know, uh, you know, a raise is basically, you know, if you offer not only the aircraft, but you offer an end-to-end -end operating platform, right? You can come in, offer pilot training, ground operations, flight planning and optimization, maintenance, and you can seamlessly integrate into other transportation options you know that the city has then that's pretty differentiated and and i think you know the the customer may start paying attention compared to somebody who comes in offering just an aircraft all right so let's pretend we're now in the sales call and here i just want to you know illustrate you know what these uh questions uh you know could be and what they could look like so situation questions, again, are the data gathering questions. Uh, you really want to minimize them with upfront homework. But in this context, you know, the situation questions could be, uh, okay, you know, what are the different transportation modalities that people use in your city? What are the major destinations that people travel to and from? You know, are there public transportation available, options available to, most, to and from most destinations? And then what type of, you know, congestion measures do you collect and analyze regularly? You know, do you collect air quality and noise pollution data, right? So you're collecting information that's either going to be new to you and helpful um, as the sales call progresses, or it's confirming things that you learned during 
your research pre-call so that you know that what you assume is actually validated. So as you move from sort of, you know, gathering, data gathering in this, with the situation questions, uh, you've picked up some critical information, right? And now you can start drilling into pain points. And these are the problem questions, right? So these are, you know, some example problem questions. Again, I, I'm sort of making these up, but, um, you know, here, you know, examples of problem questions, you know. You know, look, looking at your congestion measures, how much extra time are, are people spending traveling? You know, uh, you know, how much extra time do people spend, you know, due to traffic congestion, right? How, uh, how does that measure compare to other cities? Um, you know, how can your exist or can your existing transportation infrastructure support, you know, growing traffic volumes? Are you seeing traffic volumes growing because post COVID people are driving more and using public transportation less? You know, how are you performing on measures of air quality? How well staffed and fully resourced, you know, is your team or your department? You know, here you're start you're asking these questions to start getting their minds to focus on sort of points of pain. Um, and those are the problem questions. Then Moving from problem questions, you know, you are now looking at, you know, zeroing in on some, you know, pain points. Uh, so, you know, here with the implication question, you're looking at the effects and consequences of a problem. So let's say you've uncovered the fact that the city, in fact, does have a huge traffic congestion problem. Okay. The implication questions you can ask during the sales meeting are, well, look, you know, are you concerned that, you know, businesses may choose to locate elsewhere due to lost employee productivity, right? Cities are very focused on recruiting businesses into their cities, right? So if traffic is causing companies not to relocate there or to relocate away from the, the city, that's a huge pain point. So a question can kind of get them focused on that issue. Um, you know, are you concerned about long emergency response times due to traffic congestion, right? Cities are concerned about their citizens. And if people are, you know, you know, in harm's way because, you know, ambulances and, and public services can't reach them due to congestion, that's a problem. You know, you can ask a question about, you know, setting aside budget concerns. Would you even have the time or the space and the public support to build new infrastructure, you know, cities are dense. You know, it's really hard to build a new road or to expand a road, right? That's why perhaps a vertical takeoff and landing aircraft would be uh, pretty cool. Let's say let's let's look at another example. Let's say you uncovered that uh, you know the, the city really is dealing with you know significant air quality issues, right? You know. Here, you can kind of start putting a fine point on this by saying, look, are, are you concerned about public health risks tied to traffic pollution? You know, are your, you know, black, brown communities disproportionately impacted by traffic congestion and pollution? You know, are you on track to meet your climate action commitments? You know, these are, you know, the implication questions that really start getting them to realize they've got a problem on their hands. You know, another uncovered problem, uh, you know, you find out that the, you know, the DOT is under-resourced, understaffed, and overworked. So, you know, the implication questions could be, you know, are you too busy putting out fires to take on a big new project? Are you being asked to do more with less and less support? You know, how will you solve the challenges you highlight, you know, with no time or little support available, right? Here, you know, you really want them by thinking about and answering your implication questions to, to have them come to the conclusion that they have a problem, right? It, it's really important. You don't wanna be in the position of telling them they have a problem because that typically doesn't go well because people get defensive, right? But if you ask the right questions, they kind of come to that realization themselves uh, and they acknowledge it by virtue of thinking about and answering your questions. 
All right. At this point, you've done most of the hard work. So here is kind of the need payoff question um, component of the sales conversation. And this is the capper, right? So after discussing the implications of traffic congestion, right? You could ask, you know, would an urban air mobility solution, you know, help you take cars off the road and ease your transportation constraints? You know, hopefully they 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 hear that and say, wow, you know, that's that's an interesting idea. I, I really want to learn more, right? Or, you know, after discussing the city's struggles with air quality, you know, a need payoff question could be something like, you know, well, would a all electric, quiet, and emissions less urban air transportation solution help you address your environmental challenges? You know, hopefully, you know, they're thinking, hell yes, it would, right? You know, and implicit in all of this is, you know, look, we can do this on a fully turnkey basis, right? Because you know, in their minds, they're going, you know, vertical takeoff and landing aircraft. I mean, I, you know, how the hell would this even work? We don't have the personnel. We don't have the expertise. You know, this is a, a completely new domain. This is so far outside what we do. But if you come in and say, look, we've got a turnkey solution. We'll manage everything from ground operations to flight scheduling to maintenance. Um, you know, suddenly it becomes pretty compelling, right? So obviously what I just presented is super simplistic um, and really meant to just sort of help sort of provide examples. Uh, most sales conversations won't follow such a paint by number sequencing. And in most situations, your, your need payoff questions would probably need to be a little bit more subtle. But the point is, by managing the conversations and asking questions thoughtfully, you can bring the prospect along to the point where they realize, it's not you telling them, but they realize that they need what you're selling, right? You really want it to be their recognition, their acknowledgement, their idea. And at this point, if you've handled the investigation stage well, you know, the customer is very intrigued with how you'll be able to help them, right? At this point, this is where you can start talking about your product and its great attributes. Um, you can talk about your technology and the proof points. You can talk about, you know, you can highlight your capabilities and expertise and track record of success. This is where you can get into all of that. And, you know, at this point, you can also talk about, you know, the cool design and the, the you know, the, the, the seat massagers that your, you know, your EV toll has, right? But you don't want to launch into all of this stuff until you get the customer to the point where it's this matters because they're like, okay, we need a solution. Let's learn about how you can provide it, right? Versus telling them all about your products and features and benefits without the customer being at a point where they recognize that they need a solution. And, you know, obtaining commitment. Again, most people think that this is the most critical point in the sales cycle. You want to manage the conversation and the process where the decision has already been made at this point. The decision to make, move forward with you has already been made, right? So now the conversation really should be about how easy it is to do business with you. You want to highlight, you know, how low friction it is working with you. You know, you're not going to be time consuming. You know, there's not going to be a ton of hassle working with you. You're going to be super responsive. They're not going to get slammed with hidden fees. You know, all of these things that, you know, just really illustrate that it's easy to do business with you, right? So at this point, you've obtained the commitment without having to use, you know, some sort of magical art of persuasion or some, you know, schmarmy closing technique, right? It's just by methodically executing, you know, 
and asking questions and kind of bringing the customer along so that they realize it's, you know, so they think that it's their idea, not you telling them that they need to buy what you need or that they have a problem. It's examining their situation, asking questions so that they come to that conclusion and acknowledgement themselves. All right, so with that, um, we can certainly open it up to questions if people have those. Sounds good, thank you, Eric. And again, in the Q&A section, you can ask your questions there. Uh, our first question is from uh, Mason. Uh, his question was, uh, how much time do you spend practicing a pitch for any particular client? Uh, well, there's, 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 again, there's two, there's two components kind of before you go into a, uh, you know, a, a selling situation, you know, uh, there's the, you know, sort of the research uh, and the analysis and learning as much as you can about the, the, the prospect. Um, and once you have a certain understanding or a certain assumptions about that prospect, you, you know, you spend time thinking through what are the, you know, what are the best questions to ask as you go through the, the sales conversation um, that are relevant to kind of your, your understanding of that, that prospect. Um, and then, you know, practicing a pitch, I think, you know, it, it depends, um, you know, some of the best sales, you know, sales calls, sales conversations, the ones that, you know, result in uh, great outcomes, uh, you're not actually pitching. You're, you're having a conversation, you're discussing problems, and, you know, you're reaching a, an understanding of, you know, what they're struggling with and how you can help them versus uh, sort of a, a pitch where you're barking at them. Uh, so, um, you know, it really depends. The key, the key is the homework up front to learn as much as possible and to sort of think through the questions and how you're going to manage that conversation across the meeting or series of meetings. Thank you. Uh, you know, building on that question, do you have any suggestions for folks if they've been sort of teed up to do to pitch a solution? You know, how to break out of that? Here's here's the thing we're offering to to get into more of an investigative, gatory mode of conversation. Um, yeah, no, I think it's always. I mean, that's always the the a little bit of the challenge because you, uh, you know, you walk into a meeting, uh, you know one of the first things you do is you, you know, you work on plugging your laptop in and making sure the screen works and what have you. Um, and then next thing you know, you're, you know, you know, you're sort of parking and barking at them, uh, you know, going through, going through slides. And I think the the most important thing is to, you know, to control that meeting by taking time up front to, you know, you go through the prelim preliminaries where, you know, you, you, you make some small talk and then you go around the table, uh, you know, and people introduce themselves. And rather than immediately jump into the pitch at that point, you know, take time to say, you know, it would be really helpful to us if we could, you know, ask some questions and, you know, get into a conversation with them uh, versus, again, you know, launching immediately into sort of a park and bark pitch. Thank you. All right, our next question is related to uh, partnerships. So this person said, I work in strategic partnerships. Um, since Eric mentioned he has worked in partnerships as well, could he provide what he sees as difference uh, as differences between pitching to prospective partners as opposed to prospective customers? Um, well, yeah, no, it's an interesting question because, uh, you know, sometimes there's a distinction between sales and business development, uh, where, you know, there are certain sales contexts where, you know, you're, you're taking a, you know, a shrink, shrink wrapped box and trying to sell as many of those shrink wrapped boxes as possible, right? Where in business development is more of you know a situation where you walk into a prospect or sit down with a potential partner and you really don't know exactly where that conversation is going to go 
but by virtue of the dialogue in asking the questions and thinking creatively, you know, you mutually start, uh, you know, cultivating and, and developing a, a, you know, kind of a mutually beneficial solution. So again, it's sitting down and having conversations about both perspectives on where, you know, your partner sees opportunity, um, similarly, having conversations about where, you know, your partner, you know, sees challenges, offering up your own perspectives on, you know, whether you're seeing those same challenges or seeing those same opportunities, and then, you know, working constructively and collaboratively to find out how to, you know, how to run together. Thank you. Uh, all right, we had a question about sharing the slides. Yes, we will share the slides afterwards. Um, well, since we're at a good stopping place now, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Ali uh, to share a few updates. If you have a question that you've been uh, mulling, you still have a couple minutes to uh, tee one up in the box. Uh, but for now, let's uh, shift things over to Ali to share a few updates of upcoming activities and events. Lovely, thank you so much, Eric. And thank you, Ian. I want to take this time to share out some upcoming opportunities, some accelerator deadlines that are coming up, and some other events that may be relevant to you all. First up is our Evergreen DEI Awards. The deadline is rapidly approaching. It is tomorrow night, but if your organization is looking for some additional funding, there is $25,000 attached to these two awards, business mentorship, and great exposure to investors and potential customers. So two great opportunities, super simple to apply, should only take five minutes or so. So please consider applying for these two opportunities before midnight tomorrow night. Evergreen also partners with a lot of other organizations across the greater Midwest, partially through the Heartland Climate Tech Partnership. So I'd recommend checking out heartland-climate.org to find a great database full of accelerators, physical lab spaces, uh, incubators and awards beyond just the DEI awards that we do uh, to help continue your startup along in its commercialization journey. Now, a couple of our partners have some great climate tech accelerators that are opening up in the next few months, one of which is the Centropolis Accelerator based up in Michigan, and their accelerator is focused on cir the circular economy. And keep your eyes peeled for applications for that accelerator opening up in mid-April, and you can learn more about their program on their website. Another one of our partners through the Heartland Climate Tech Partnership is the Spark Clean Tech Accelerator in Knoxville, Tennessee. And they are actively recruiting for startups for their program right now. It is a 12 week business accelerator in Tennessee. And as a part of it, you receive some funds, great business mentorship, connections, prototyping assistance, and more. And applications close for this accelerator in May. So plenty of time to submit your application. Uh, it's a great, great opportunity. There's several other accelerators that are actively recruiting right now. These are all virtual programs, so you can do them from anywhere, and they all have both some funds and some investment attached to them, but the applications are all rapidly approaching with their derivatives in March, as well as the Ignite X Climate Tech Accelerator. Uh, Arch Grants is another great one, as well as the Clean Tech Open, which is actually the world's largest clean tech accelerator. So feel free to reach out to Evergreen if you have questions about any of these upcoming opportunities and deadlines. Uh, but yeah, we definitely recommend checking them out. And with that, here's our email address if you do have any additional questions on all of these opportunities that I just shared out. I know there's a lot, but lots of great stuff for climate tech entrepreneurs. People want to help you. Uh, so please consider applying for these opportunities. Uh, with that, I'll pass it back over to you, Ian, to close things out. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Allie. Uh, haven't heard any additional questions. So uh, with this, I want to say thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, thank you to Eric for your wisdom on this experience. 
we will be uh, sharing uh, this uh, materials from this event. Uh, we have a YouTube channel where this event, the recording will live uh, and it'll be up in a couple days. Uh, so you can check that out as well um, and uh, stay in touch as we are uh, scheduling more events. We'll, we'll share that information out as well. We'll be continuing this uh, sales uh, and business development support series into the spring and summer as well. Uh, as always, welcome any feedback you have, but for now, thanks for coming and have a great afternoon.